Teachers, hello! My name is Sarah Smith. Welcome to Lead to Teach and welcome to the first of a two-part training session about reinforcing appropriate behavior. Uh, remember that you can download guided notes to accompany this session if you want to on leadtoteach.com. But otherwise, I want to start by telling you a story about Miss Renee, oh, whom I just love. <laughs> Miss Renee was my daughter's kindergarten teacher, and I have learned in the 10, 15 years since I've known this woman that you cannot say her name without the people around you erupting in approval and saying, oh, don't you just love Miss Renee? We love Miss Renee. Oh, we are crazy about Miss Renee. And it doesn't matter if you're talking to former students or parents or administrators or other teachers, everybody loves this woman, this teacher. And part of that, a huge part of that, is because she is so good at building relationships. So this is a picture of my Isabel on the very last day of kindergarten with Miss Renee. And I remember that she came out into the kitchen that morning and she had on this new yellow and white linen dress. And on the front of that linen dress, she had written in Sharpie, I love Miss Renee. <laughs> And then she had tried to draw a heart, but the heart hadn't really worked, so she just scribbled it out. Um, and I'm laughing about it now, but at the time, you better believe that I was like, oh, what have you done? Oh my goodness. Like, of course, we had to have a talk about not writing on clothes, but that's how much she loved Miss Renee, that she was willing to write it and proclaim it on her brand new dress on the last day of school. <laughs> okay, so I'm coming back to our expectations model. Do you remember we've said, that expectations only maintain if they are supported by effective feedback. And the first component of feedback is praise, right? Affirmation, affirmative feedback is the first and I would say maybe even more important side of that two-sided coin that makes up feedback. So when you hear the term reinforcement, my question for you is what comes to mind? For me, before I started my graduate program in applied behavior analysis, I think I thought of this in two ways. I would have given you two umbrella categories and that would be praise and rewards. After this three-year program that I did, I realized it's a lot more extensive and a lot more complex than that. Reinforcement can be non-contingent, non-vocal, vocal or tangible. And we will talk about each of those in more depth, but just these first two today. How do you reinforce non-contingently and non-vocally? Okay, in other words, we're going to say, how do you help students feel safe and loved in your classroom setting? Let's start with non-contingent reinforcement. Non-contingent reinforcement is defined as being attention or recognition that's given to students without first requiring that they meet an expectation. They don't have to do anything to earn your approval. So this is a picture of me with my daughter, Isabel, on the day that she was born or maybe day after, I don't know, but... <laughs> She hadn't done anything to gain my affection and my undying love, and she already had it. Just by virtue of her being mine, I loved her. And, and we want to hold the same idea in our classrooms, that just by virtue of you being in my classroom and being my student, I'm going to give you attention and recognition and love. So we're talking here about relationship building. Relationship building is going to fall under this umbrella of non-contingent reinforcement. Can we talk first about why that's so important? Why do you build relationships? This might seem really obvious, but I'm going to say very first because everybody is somebody's son or daughter or grandson or granddaughter or niece or nephew, right? Um, this is a picture of my nephew, Gabriel. And here's my favorite part about this picture is that the bike helmet strap is across his chin, <laughs> not under his chin. But I am crazy about this little kid. I love this little kid. And I hope that every teacher he has is good to him because he means so much to me. Um, do you remember probably the most famous line in the Declaration of Independence is, we hold this, this truth to be self-evident that all men, women, and children are created equal, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all of us have equal value and worth. Here's what the research tells us, is that teacher-student relationships rank above parental involvement, small group learning, and class size in relation to student achievement. Does that shock you? It shocks me a little bit because I remember as a teacher sometimes thinking like, oh, if I just had 
parents who were more involved, my kiddos would do better. If I could just do more small groups, it would be easier to help them learn this content. If I had a smaller class, oh, it would be so much better, so much easier to teach what I need to teach. But none of those rank as high as teacher-student relationships on our list of effective teacher practices. Here's another piece of research, is that highly effective teachers consistently address students by name, say please and thank you, smile, and show love to their students. And this may be the only time I've ever read the word love in an academic text. <laughs> but that's what distinguishes minimally or moderately effective teachers from highly effective teachers, is this ability to show love to their students. Okay, uh, another piece of research. The most effective teachers are those who are warm demanders. Have you heard that term? Warm demanders, that is they build good relationships with their students while still maintaining high expectations of them. So my expectations don't budge, but I'm gonna give you a lot of support and a lot of relationship in helping you meet my expectations. Uh, for me, this research is why I wink, pat, and whisper every time I first enter a classroom. Uh, as an instructional coach, I go in and support a lot of teachers, especially new teachers, and one of the first things I do when I get into a classroom, even if I'm just there to observe the first day, is I kind of scan and I try to identify, okay, <laughs> who are the kingpins in this classroom? Who are the ringleaders that are maybe toppling other kids because of their disruptions? And I try to make a connection with them very first. Um, so I might catch their eye from across the room and just do a little wink or do a little wave. Or one time recently, I walked out of a classroom and this little girl who had been so disruptive hadn't once gotten out of her seat. So <laughs> as I left the classroom, I patted her on the back and I said, do you know what I noticed, Paisley? You did such a good job sitting in your seat the whole time. Thanks, dear. Gave her a little wink, gave her a little pat and walked out the door. And the next time I came in and I was doing a guest lesson, guess what she did? She scooted up and sat like this the entire time. And, and I'm not saying that's all you have to do to achieve that behavior, certainly not, but it's certainly the first step. It's certainly one of the most major components. This is a picture of uh, one of the most difficult students I ever, ever, ever had, my cute little Gage. And this is the type of student, the reason I have his picture here is because this is the type of student that needs our most attention and needs our greatest attention and affection when they struggle so much behaviorally. Um, and he did, this kiddo struggled, struggled, struggled behaviorally. Um, but as we worked on the relationship, the struggle became easier. It became more manageable. It didn't go away, but it became manageable. So let's talk then about how do you achieve that? I'm gonna give you three relationship building strategies that I think are pretty easy and also useful to implement in any given elementary classroom. First one would be morning greetings, which I'm going to define as being present at the door as each student first enters the classroom and acknowledging each student by name. Um, <laughs> can I tell you something kind of funny is I was working with this teacher just a few months ago and he said to me, you know, when you first talked about the importance of morning greetings, I thought, mm, that's kind of hokey. <laughs> I can't see that they would do that much good. And he said he was at the habit of sitting at his computer as the kids came through the door and they knew to come in quietly and they knew the routine, they knew what to do and where to go. But he was at the habit of sitting at his computer so that he could get some work done. And he said, but after I heard your pitch, I decided I would just try it for a week. And he, he said, I'll never go back. He said, I couldn't believe the difference it made in how the kids responded to me as I stood at the door and greeted them as they came in and said hello to every single one of them. Um, why morning greetings? I would say, first of all, because they help offer a safe and a positive start to everybody's school day. I have a picture of my cute mom here because my mom is somebody who grew up in a very, very trauma impacted background. Her father was an alcoholic. Her three older brothers were also alcoholics and used a lot of drugs in the home. Uh, her mom worked at a hospital, but worked the swing shift, which is 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. So what that meant is every day when my mom got home from school, her mom wasn't there. Her mom was already at work. And every morning when my mom left for school, 
her mom was sleeping because she had already worked <laughs> the entire afternoon and evening before. Um, and my, my poor sweet mom has just had so many negative complications in her life because of how she grew up. And I think I, I would hope her teachers would greet her by name every morning as she came through the door. I hope they would acknowledge her and look at her and make her feel safe and loved because she's not getting that at home. And unfortunately, my mom is not an isolated example, right? She's not an isolated statistic. We've got lots of kids in our country, in our communities, in our neighborhoods that are unfortunately in similar circumstances where they are not receiving the attention, the affection that they need at home. So as teachers, that's one simple practice we can put into place to begin to give that to them. Why morning greetings? Because they allow the teacher to meet multiple needs. So <laughs> this is super informal, but I just took a sticky note one morning as I was standing at the door and I just jotted down every time I did something other than say hello to a student by name. What else did I do as I stood at the door and greeted every single kid who came in? Ready? There's a lot. I tied a shoe. I helped unzip a coat. Remember, this is first grade. I talked with an aide. I answered a parent question. I waved to my principal. I helped several kids read the vocabulary question of the day. I reminded, reminded those same students what that vocabulary word meant. <laughs> I redirected a student to come in calmly and quietly. Here's the back of the sticky note. I corrected five papers with individual students. I thanked several students for their homework. I reminded a few others to go get their homework. I accepted a parent note. I redirected yet another student to come in quietly. I answered the resource teacher's question and the one that I think is most important, I personally greeted 23 students by name. But I include all of these because it's about more than just making them feel welcome and loved. It's about beginning to meet other needs too as soon as they come in the door. Okay, last one. Why morning greetings? Because they help set a positive and, and good behavioral climate for the day. <laughs> I had a little kiddo one year named Braxton who came in the door one morning karate chopping. He was going, hi ya and just came in the door, just charged and energized. <laughs> and I said, oh, Braxton, I'm gonna have you turn around and go back out and come in calmly this time. And he walks out like this, but then he comes back in and he says, hi, Miss Smith. And I said, hi, buddy, come on in, welcome. <laughs> that could have quickly escalated, right? Yeah, so morning greetings help set a good behavioral climate. Okay. Next question, next section, what do all of these have in common? Sweetie, Petey, dude, butter, buddy, dear, little lady, friend, cute girl, hun, miss, fill in the name, Emma, sir. What do they all have in common? And they were pet names, I'm sure you recognize their pet names, but they were pet names that I saw used by a variety of highly effective teachers in a single school year. I looked at these highly effective teachers and noticed that this is something they had in common, that they were using these pet names. So I'm gonna tell you my definition of what a pet name is. And that would be addressing a student by an affectionate nickname. Of course, I'm going to call you by your name too, but I might also use affectionate nicknames as well. Why would you use pet names? One reason could be because they indicate familiarity and deeper bonds. Um, I was in a teacher's classroom, a kinder classroom, where <laughs> this teacher was just so sweet and she did this so effortlessly and so smoothly that she would use these pet names uh, with her students just all day uh, as they handed her something. Thanks, sweet girl, as they raised their hand. Yes, sir, what would you like to say as they uh, turned in an assignment? Oh, nice job, little lady. It just made her classroom feel so warm and inclusive and welcoming and and part of her effectiveness was this use of pet names. Okay, that's all I'm gonna say about that. Another way, the third way I'm going to recommend that we can build relationships beyond what we've already talked about <laughs> is to use humor, ready? I'm gonna say my definition of this is taking advantage of or creating opportunities to make students smile or laugh. That's, that's as simple as that. Can you create or take advantage of opportunities to make your students smile or laugh? Why do we use humor? The first reason I think we would want to consider humor in our classroom is because it serves to quickly bond people together and not just students, but adults as well, right? This is true of all ages in any given population. 
Uh, the reason I have a picture of my daughter Isabel here with my uncle Wade, her great uncle, is because Isabel didn't grow up around Wade. She didn't really get to know him until about fourth grade when he and his family moved across the country closer to us. Um, <laughs> but it only took maybe a day, two days tops, for her to declare that Wade was one of her favorite people on this planet. And why? Because Wade is rockin' hilarious. He is so funny. And what's interesting to me is that when her friends met him too, um, in later years, same reaction. Oh, we love Wade. Wade is so funny. Wade's one of my favorite people. They all quickly attached to him and quickly felt bonded to him because of his use of humor. Uh, let me tell you about an experiment that a German psychologist did back in 1988. Uh, <laughs> he had people read cartoons holding a pen in their mouth. Uh, and I don't know that you can see this, but there's a pen in the mouth in this case too. And then he had them rate how funny they thought the cartoons were. And what he found was that people who held the pen with their teeth, which engaged smiling muscles, rated cartoons as funnier than people who held the pen with their lips, which uses muscles incompatible with smiling. So the idea here is that humor causes students to rate the environment as more enjoyable, right? The more they laugh, the more they smile, the more enjoyable they are going to rate that classroom environment as being. So I want to show you a series of clips of joking around in first grade, joking around with first graders. And I just want you to ponder what might be the benefits of using humor in the classroom? What benefits could you see from this? Get me out. And she would look around. What other words could I find with wurra, wurra, wurra? Because she will sing about them. So my turn first. Wurra. Can you do it? Wurra. 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 Oh, brother. Okay. <laughs> so I will, Ethan, you can just keep your hand down. Dude. I will put her here. This is the trickiest one. My first graders last year got kind of upset when they saw the word C plus ing equals seeing. Like I am seeing you with my eyeballs. I'm seeing you, Benj. <laughs> Show me if you're seeing me with your eyeballs. Good, and you can put your hands up. First one there, Sabrina, thank you. Okay, last one will be our trickiest one. Tell me, what are the first three letters you hear in stripes? Stripes, first three letters. Time's up. The beginning blend in stripes was S T R. You forgot your R. Oh, I haven't called on anyone. Listen, st st stripes. Question, pa James. What? Oh, you forgot the R. Kate, did I say the first three? Yeah. Well. Fingers up. Stretch. Stripes. First three letters. St. Er. Hold on, I'm gonna check if you did it, if you got it right. Stir. <laughs> students get a point. Although I'm now changing your name from students to stinkers. <laughs> How dare you beat the teacher in a game? Little oh, stinkers. Erase, erase. My mommy taught me how to make a wet a bee, and I'm really, really good at wet a bees. So I'm going to teach you how to make a capital B. My mommy told me when you do the capital B, you always have to start at the top. If you don't start at the top, you get in big trouble. It's wrong. So you start at the top and you go all the way down. <laughs> then you have to come back to the top and you have to curve a wound to the middle and a wound to the bottom. That's how you do a cap. 
<laughs> why, why would you do that to me? <laughs> why did you do that to me? I made it too big? <laughs> okay, I will make it a little bit smaller. Okay. I will. So teachers rule of thumb is I can stay in character as long as they're not calling out being super silly, otherwise I correct it. I can start at the top and go all the way down. <laughs> then I can go a wound to the middle and a wound to the bottom. Okay, that time I did it much smaller. Why, did, why don't you like that one? Why don't you like that one? What'll go? Because you did it too small. I did it too small? Fine, I will do another one, and this time it won't be too big and it won't be too small. You know what? I just realized the problem. All the words I've been doing have trigraph IGH in them, so I'm going to take a break from IGH. Do not give me that smarty pants look, James. And we're going to do work. Stop it. Okay, just for that, you get two syllables. Hands up. What is this smart? Hands up. Clap with me the word winter. Ready? Win ter for syllable for syllable win. Okay. What benefits did you think of? Here's a couple that I thought of uh, that come from using humor in the classroom. One is that it connects the kids to the teacher, right? I like to be around somebody who makes me laugh or smile. Another one is that it might unify students as a group. What I think is so funny, I don't know if you noticed it in the first video. But as the kids were laughing, they were looking at each other. They were looking around at each other like, oh my goodness, isn't this hilarious? And it, it unifies them as peers. And then the final one is just that it makes that classroom more enjoyable, right? I have less emotional behavior, less meltdowns. I have less um, problems with students wanting not to come to school. If it's an enjoyable environment, made more enjoyable by the use of humor. My experience as an instructional coach has been that teachers who are only moderately or minimally effective tend to be more straight-faced and stoic with their students. They tend to be just a little bit more standoffish than highly effective teachers who tend to use more warmth and more humor. It's interesting to me as I've worked with principals of some of these teachers, they often make the comment that these moderately or minimally effective teachers seem to lack warmth. They say something like, I can't put my finger on it, but she just she's not very warm with the kids. Yeah, she's just not very nurturing. She just doesn't have a lot of warmth and they view that as being problematic because the relationship suffers, right? And relationships are so, so, so important <laughs> in being an effective teacher. I will give you a quick tip. Probably I don't need to give this, but I'm going to say it for my sake more than yours so that I know I said it, is that you'd want to make sure expectations and corrections were solidly in place first, before you began using humor, right? <laughs> um, whenever I joke around with kids in a classroom setting, I make sure they understand my expectations first, that you follow my directions the first time. You raise your hand if you have something to say. Are we going to laugh and have a good time? Yeah, but if I ask for quiet, we go back to quiet. If I uh, ask you to scoot your chairs in, we're going to scoot chairs in, even if we've been laughing. So, okay, now I've said it, I can keep going. In summary, we're going to say relationship building includes these three components. Greeting students every morning, every student by name every morning, addressing students not only by their names, but also by pet names, and using occasional humor. And of course, this is not an exhaustive list. There's other ways you can build relationships with students. These are just some ideas that I have seen used and that I have tried that I have seen to be effective. Okay, I told you we were gonna talk about non-contingent reinforcement and non-vocal reinforcement. So let's shift now to non-vocal reinforcement. Non-vocal reinforcement is attention or recognition given to someone without words, right? Using our bodies. In other words, we're going to say it's affection. So we're talking today about relationship building and affection in terms of reinforcing students. Let's talk first about why would it be important to use affection? Why would you do that? 
um, do, are you familiar with the 1944 experiment, which is reported to have happened in American hospitals in 1944. And what happened was uh, there was a group of 40 babies that uh, were in a, a facility where the caregivers were directed to meet their physiological needs, but nothing else. So you can feed them, you can bathe them, change their diapers, keep them warm, but the caregivers were directed not to look at or touch or interact with the babies more than absolutely necessary to meet those physiological needs. And the reported outcome of the experiment is that it was halted after four months because half of the babies, half of those 40 babies had died. Um, so why use affection? Because as humans, <laughs> we need touch, we need affection. Um, and of course there are always exceptions, you know, for kids with special needs, but in general, humans need and thrive on affection. This is me again with my cute little nephew, Gabriel, and I just, oh, I, there, there's nothing better than cuddling and loving on that new little baby, but we continue to need that affection even as we get older. Here's what research tells us, is that the average American child receives an estimated, are you ready for this? This is just so oh, scary, 12 minutes of attention each day from his or her parents. And I want you to notice when this study came out. That was Harry Wong in 2009, which was right around the time of the first iPhone, right? So thinking now, <laughs> a decade and a half later, do you think that number has gone up or down? Do you think kids are getting more or less attention from parents? And unfortunately, my guess would be that they're getting less attention from parents than ever. Uh, here's something that we know from the CDC is that connection is the primary deterrent of trauma-related problems. In other words, problems like anger or acting out aggressively, feeling lonely, having difficulty concentrating, or being emotionally disturbed, all of those trauma-related problems are deterred by connection. And especially when it comes to kids exhibiting those trauma-related problems, connection with adults. Interesting. It's why I'm going to come back to this. I'm going to say it one more time. This is why teacher student relationships rank above, do you remember? Parental involvement, small group learning, and class size in relation to student achievement. I, I, I feel like probably reinforcement and relationships are, are some of those ideas that we say, oh yeah, I know about that. Mm -hmm. Yep, I'm a teacher. That's one of the first things I learned, but my hope in emphasizing it so much here is to say, yeah, there's a reason it's one of the first things you learned about. There's a reason it's so foundational in any effective classroom <laughs> because it matters so much and has such great impact. So let's talk about then, how do you do this when we're looking at non-vocal reinforcement, when we're looking at providing affection to students? I'm just gonna give you two affection promoting strategies, gestures and touch. Gestures, are using hand actions or facial movements in order to express caring or approval for someone. So I'm not touching you, I'm just using a hand action or a facial movement in order to express my caring about you. I have a question here, how many can you think of in 30 seconds? Of course, pause this if you want to and jot some down, but here are a couple that I've thought of. It could be high fives. Okay, admittedly that would be making contact, but sometimes I've even seen teachers do it with like a whole group of kids. Give me a high five, ready? One, two, three. And they pretend at a high five. Thumbs up, smiles, winks, and nods. All of those are gestures that would show students we care about them. Why would you want to implement gestures immediately in your classroom? Whether it's the first day of school or your first day back deciding that you want to work on this, I would say first because they allow for such quick connections. Um, it's I'm going back to <laughs> those really difficult students, those kind of ringleaders that I've mentioned in, in difficult classrooms. They are the first kids that I look at and, and give a quick wink to because I want to make a connection with them. It is why, you guys, my right eye will someday be far more wrinkled than my left eye because it's the eye that I wink with and I constantly find kids that I can wink at and make a connection with during instruction. Why implement gestures immediately? Because they don't interrupt the flow of instruction, right? As I'm telling kids, uh, 
go ahead and take your books out and we're turning to page 400 to I can quickly start winking and not slow anything down as I see kids that are ready. Um, sometimes I'll do this after a partner talk. When kids are done talking to their partner and then they turn forward and they're showing me that they're ready, a wink and a thumbs up goes a long way toward reinforcing that behavior and making them feel noticed. Oh, nice job. Good. Thanks for sitting ready. Mm -hmm. And of course, I just said, thanks for sitting ready, which you might be saying, mm, that's not non-vocal, but but they learn that that's what this means, right? That that, that that indicates my approval of that behavior. Okay, touch, here, here's what we know about touch. Um, or Okay, let's, let's shift then from gestures to touch. Let me say it that way, is making physical contact with somebody, okay? So we're talking about like hugs, shoulder pats, fist bumps, high fives. If you make physical contact with somebody, that falls under the category of touch. And here's what the research tells us about touch, is that children who do not receive adequate touch tend not to grow to their expected height and weight, not to have resilient immune systems, and to exhibit greater, are you gonna be surprised? Probably not, behavioral problems than peers who receive adequate touch. So we, we could go back to that 1944 experiment here and say, yeah, we've seen it. We know the physiological outcome of of kids not being touched enough. Uh, why else use touch? <laughs> because it's a preventative measure. We can prevent students uh, acting out for attention if we just give it to them for free at occasional periods throughout the day. I love this little book about noisy Nora because she's being so noisy all night long and her parents finally realize it's just because she wanted their attention. And it seems simple, but it's so true in our classrooms. I was with a teacher a couple of years ago who had this little boy that was really really difficult and we knew that his home life was really hard and because of that you know knowing he didn't have a lot of parental involvement knowing that um, he was a kid that re that unfortunately was probably highly neglected the strategy we talked about putting into place was was touch we said you know like can you just touch this kid's shoulder every time you walk by or pat him on the head or fist bump or something to let him know that you're aware of him. And, and this teacher agreed that she would try it, so I left. Um, and I came back two days later expecting her to say like, okay, it worked at first, but then da 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 da. And no, her report was, I, ca I can't believe the difference it's making. It's like as soon as he sees me coming, he scoots up and sits a little straighter because he knows I'm going to make contact with him. He knows I'm going to pay attention to him. And it ended up being, this isn't always the case, but in that case, it ended up being that that was enough to prevent this student's problem behavior from further escalating. Pretty cool. Why else use touch? Because it helps create lasting connections. So earlier you saw a picture of my daughter Isabel with her kinder teacher. This is Isabel with her fourth grade teacher, whom we also loved and adored. And we weren't alone in that either. A lot of students, a lot of parents, administrators, faculty love and adore Mrs. Stewart, partially because she's so good at affection. I mean, I, th I think you can see even in this picture just how closely she's holding her. <laughs> but this is a woman who knows how to use touch to her advantage to make kids feel welcomed and connected with. Okay, last question then is what did you like or learn about reinforcing appropriate behavior? We talked about relationship building and affection, right? That non-contingent reinforcement and non-vocal reinforcement. Is there anything that stuck out to you that you liked or learned about those types of reinforcement? And for me, it's the idea that relationships and affection are a form of reinforcement, yes, but they're also a form of prevention. They're also ways that I can prevent problems from growing and escalating just by virtue of connecting with my kiddos. The end. Casey, okay, yeah.